Well, grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 21-year-old Greta Zimmer made her way through Times Square on a very crowded afternoon after work on August 14th, 1945. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, some stranger grabbed her. He held her head in the crook of his arm, held her waist with his other hand, and leaned in for a kiss. Now right now, some of you are feeling some very, very strong indignation on the way this man is treating this woman especially after some of the events from this past week. And rightfully so, you would feel that way. A lot of you are also probably feeling horror for this, this poor 21-year-old woman who is now being violated by this man. But what if, what if, just what if, that man was you or me? And what if the person being kissed was Jesus Christ himself? Now, you're probably thinking, well, you know, Jesus knows all of us. Um, he knows even the number of hairs. He loves all people, right? But, but I want you to think about it this way. As God has allowed you to go through various types of struggles this week, these last few days, struggles at home, struggles in your workplace, struggles with your health, as you see your bank account going low, you might be saying to yourself, I have no idea who this Jesus is. And then there's Jesus looking at us. To him, we may be total strangers, just like the man in Times Square. He may not recognize us as children of God because of our behaviors, our unwholesome thoughts, our foul language, our mean and selfish behavior. All these things may make us mutually strangers to Jesus. So imagine you and me, these, these strangers of God with these unhealthy thoughts and words and deeds approaching Jesus for a kiss. Imagine how he would react. To get a sense of how Jesus would respond to something like that, I want to invite you all today to take a look at Luke's gospel in chapter 22, which I have had printed for you on page seven of your worship folder. I want to invite you all to open up to page seven of your worship folder there. On page seven, you're going to see where it says sermon text. And let us take a look at Luke chapter 22, verses 47 through 48. And this is how it reads. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas... One of the twelve was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Folks, Jesus let Judas kiss him. Jesus let Judas, a, a betrayer, one who had become a stranger and an enemy to him, he let that man kiss him. Well, if today we are approaching Jesus in this way, if we are coming to him with our thoughts, with our strangerness, with our betrayal, and understand that Jesus lets each of us kiss him too. Jesus lets us, sinners, kiss him. 
Now, someone like Greta, if she were to go to WikiHow, she would find some, some steps on what she could do if someone were trying to kiss you that you did not want. WikiHow suggests that you can push away from them or pull away from them. Be calm and say in a very, very firm voice, no. Now, Jesus, though, interesting, he does not push away from Judas. He's Jesus. He can do this. He doesn't pull away from Judas, nor does he stop him and tell him no. He actually says to Judas, friend, do what you've come to do. Jesus calls Judas, who's about to betray him with a kiss, he calls him friend. What's interesting is that if you look at the Greek that Luke uses for the word kiss, you will see that it is a word that is called philema. Philema is related to philos, which means friend. And this philos is where we get the word phileo, which is sort of a friendly love. So when Judas goes to kiss Jesus, he calls him friend. But when you look closely at the Greek that's used um, by Matthew when he describes this, it's actually not this word for friend. He uses the word hetare. This word hetare means friend, but it's sort of a friend who looks out for his own interests. It's someone who pays, so to speak, lip service to Jesus. Today, we might call someone who's hetare, we might call them a frenemy. Someone who acts like a friend, but they're really an enemy. Hetare, hetare is what we, people of God, are often like towards God, all throughout the Bible. Isaiah, has something to say about this in chapter 29, verse 13. The Lord says, these people, listen to this, these people come to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And then James, the brother of Jesus, says in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 of his letter, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who, we have, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And then the Apostle John, in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 20, says this. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now, if you're like me, the brother or the sister that you hate most is actually yourself. I struggle probably more with self-hatred than I do of anyone else because of all of my mistakes. Woke up in the middle of the night thinking about things I've done in the past. And you probably remember the story I told you about one time when I was a missionary in Japan, how because I had made a mistake while I was there, I walked and went outside church during the service. Most often, we pull away and push away and say no to the sinner, no to even ourselves. So many times people tell me, Pastor, I just can't forgive myself. 
But Jesus is not like us. Even though we come to him with hetaire, he lets us kiss him. Jesus lets us approach him and come near him that he might be for us, philos, a friend. Now, poor Greta, Greta Zimmerman, on that day in um, August 1945, really was caught off guard, totally caught off guard where she could not even react before this person had completely um, absorbed her into his arms. There was nothing she could really do except just go limp. Her arms dropped to her side, her knees laxed as she was caught in this man's embrace. Well, interestingly, Jesus, after Judas kisses him, does the same thing. He does not resist Judas' kiss. He does not push him away. Knowing that as Judas kisses him, it's going to identify those who came to arrest him that he is there, that he's Jesus. Instead, he lets Judas kiss him. He lets the people who come to arrest him seize him, seize him and bind him and lead him away to be crucified like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus lets humanity use their lips. We use our lips to abuse him with insults, mockery, and even spit. Jesus lets Hetaire come near him so that he can be for us a different kind of love. I'm not talking about filio, but we're talking about agape. Jesus lets his frenemies approach him. He lets strangers approach him. He lets his enemies approach him to kiss him so that he can be agape for us. Jesus lets us, all humans who have sinned, approach him so that he can be the love for his enemies and his neighbor. He, approach, he lets us approach him with our kiss so that he can be for us the greater love that is laid down for one's friends. He does this to be for us the one and only begotten Son of God who so loved us that he gave that one and only Son so that all of us would have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. What Jesus did here in letting Judas kiss him crushed me this week as I recalled something that I did when I was a police officer. How I once seemed to do something for a citizen that a fellow police officer might have perceived as a betrayal. I felt terrible about it and really struggled with that heavy heart this week and I wanted to reach out to that police officer but he has since moved away and I do not know where to find him. But the blessing of Jesus being in that garden as Judas approaches is that Jesus is right where Judas, right where we, his frenemies, can find him so that we can kiss him and he can be for us the agape that we need for everlasting life. Jesus does not push us away. But after three days, he pushed death away. Amen? Amen? He pulled off the hands of Satan. And he said no to our condemnation and promises us everlasting life. Jesus lets us kiss him that we might receive from him true agape love. A love that leads to everlasting life. 
Now as Greta suddenly finds this man planting a kiss on her lips, she could push away. She could pull away. She could tell him, no, don't ever do that again. But instead, Greta did something that it talks about on WikiHow. It said you can also, when something like this happens, someone steals a kiss, you can take a breath and think about maybe what that person's intentions were. It doesn't justify the kiss, but maybe there was some reason or something they were trying to say. Greta, who was a nursing assistant dressed in her nursing uniform out on the street in Times Square that day, knew what time it was. On August 14th, 1945, all of New York, all of the nation was astir with the news that World War II was finally over. And this man who had approached her was a sailor who had been in the Pacific and was now home and was overjoyed. He was not going to have to go back into combat anymore. So I want you to imagine that if you had lived through six years of a war that killed 50 million people, you would probably want to kiss somebody too. Anybody. And so when this man kissed her, she knew that it wasn't a romantic thing. She understood that this sailor had been in a place where nurses were the only thing that saved people in his life. And he just wanted to say, thank you. This is what happens with us as we approach Jesus. See, a lot of us today have been in a war. Not a war against nations like Ukraine and Russia, but a war within. A war within our own households with family members. A war with our employers. A war with the health afflictions and aging that are ravishing our bodies. A war with the devil constantly tempting us to do wrong. And Jesus has today proclaimed to you a victory. A victory of all those, over all those things that taunt and, and, and horrify you. A victory over your sins. That's why, to the surprise of all those people in that house, in our gospel lesson today, he lets the woman who had lead, led a sinful lifestyle kiss his feet. She's kissing, her, kissing his feet out of gratitude because of all of the sins that were forgiven. It's interesting, the word that they use for kiss there, for what this lady is doing to Jesus' feet, is not philema, but it's kata phileo. And this kata here conveys this idea that you're throwing yourself down. It's a fervent kissing of someone's feet, a fervent kissing of that person out of praise and thanksgiving and worship for something they have done. So we are all today, as we come here on our knees in confession and absolution, our katafileo. We are fervently kissing Jesus' feet and thanking him for wiping out all of that sin and declaring a victory over the war between us and Satan. Frankly, the war between us and him. And granting us the promise of everlasting life. So I want, you to, I want you to see something for a minute. Pull this aside. When you come to worship, you are able to kiss Jesus. Amen. At communion, you receive the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you in the bread and the wine. You get to put to your lips Jesus Christ and his forgiveness. When you come up, what's the first thing we say to you? When you arrive, welcome to the Lord's table. You are welcome. You come as sinners and Christ lets you kiss him so that you might receive the forgiveness of sins and the strength to live a new life. Hallelujah. As we approach Jesus as sinners... As we approach Jesus with unclean thoughts, unclean words, unclean actions, as we approach him as betrayers and strangers, church, he lets us kiss him. 
As we come to church, we're invited then, according to the apostle there, to greet one another with a holy kiss. Whether we do that literally or not, the idea is that we are showing to one another a fervent love that we've received through Christ. We love, John says, because Christ first loved us. And we express that love to one another in church. So this couple, or these two people, these two perfect strangers are, are now brought together in history. When this sailor grabbed a hold of Greta, there was a photographer from Life Magazine. We're going to get this photo up for you on screen here. There was a, tar- a, a photographer from Life Magazine. He was right there to capture it. And he captured this shot, and it went into Life magazine where it was published. And even to this day, you can find this photograph. It is one of the 20 most famous photographs and has its influence in history. It's got various names, the Victory Kiss, uh, uh, Victory Day on Times Square, various names throughout the year. There's even a statue of it. There's even a statue of it in Sarasota. Now, throughout the year, the photographer got, forgot to get their names. And so for many years, they did not know who these two people were. Lots of folks came forward to claim that they were the person. In fact, there's a guy in Plantation, Florida, who actually said he was the sailor. <laughs> I just heard today that he lives next door to Nick Heine, Brad Heine's son. He used to. <laughs> the sailor, folks, can be us. We are so grateful and thankful. We got to feel it, feel, you know, feel it, Jesus, and we kiss him in our thankfulness and our gratitude for all that he's done. The photographer over the years, as people remember this moment, said that when they get to heaven, they believe that that's what they'll see. When you come to church, this is what you see. You see us worshiping, kissing Jesus. You see Jesus receiving you despite your hetaide, your strangerness, your, betray, your betrayals, and lets you kiss him that you might receive his forgiveness, his agape, and the promise of everlasting life. So often we may feel like strangers to God. What he's doing in our life as we struggle through things makes no sense to us. We don't know that God. And very often, he may not know us by what we're doing, thinking and saying. And yet today, we have this reassurance that whatever way we come to him, he's going to let you kiss him so that you know that he's near, that he loves you, and always receives you. Today, church, Jesus lets you kiss him as you worship him and give thanks to him for all that he's done for you and for the promises that he's given to you of everlasting life. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.